Hello all, good evening um, to everybody and welcome to the last event of Geos Revoluciones 2.0. This project aims to draw attention to uh, violence against women and girls by providing a platform for artists, change makers, organizations and charities to express, to reflect and uh, to prevent and hopefully heal. Um, this project is powered by Lone Art and I'm Maria Gonzalez, um, the founder of this organization and creative director. So um, you have all the details about Lone Art and Shiro's project in the chat created by our colleague um, Daniela. Um, before uh, we start with the art discussion, I would like to say a few words on how to share this space today. So first, uh, even though we're going to talk about art, about women's misrepresentation, let's not forget that we will address topic, uh, topics such as um, violence against women and rape and sexual abuse. So these might trigger um, past traumas or experiences. Uh, please uh, be safe. Uh, the most important is that you enjoy this event tonight, that you feel comfortable. And if you need to leave, you leave and come back later, or you can rewatch uh, the, um, the video afterwards. The second note is that this is um, a space of care. Um, so if, um, and we're talking, we're addressing a sensitive topic. And uh, sometimes we might not find the words, and the words, um, participants, speakers, um, or attendees. Um, so it's fine if we sleep like the wrong expression or the wrong word. Is completely fine. Let's all feel uh, like at home. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so tonight we've got four fabulous speakers contributing. Uh, we've got uh, Catherine McCormack, author, independent creator and consultant, lecturer at Sotheby's Institute of Art, author of Women in the Picture, uh, Women Art and the Power of Looking. Second speaker is Miranda Gavin, freelance writer, photographer, blogger, and educator. The third speaker is Alinta Sara, co-founder of Bon Contage. Um, uh, bon Contage is, is, a, is a, a collaborative um, initiative to, um, to raise awareness about historical trajectories and universal themes that connect communities at the Global South. And the last but not the least, Rahima, uh, Begum, uh, artist, creative consultant, activist, and founding director of the International Human Rights Organization for Slaves Beings. Um, at the end of the art discussions, uh, we will have 20 minutes, more or less, um, for questions. So if you've got any question, just write question in capital letters, if possible, and, and you can write it in there. And um, if we have artists among our audience, please uh, don't leave. Uh, in the middle, because today is the Shiro's Prize, uh, is the last event of this um, of this edition. So we have two two prizes to give to one to two of our Shiro's artists um, that participated in this edition. One prize is three hundred pounds, and the second one is two hundred pounds to support your practice and to keep you going. Um, so yeah, so I think without further ado, welcome to Catherine, to Rahima. Um, and, and Alinta and Miranda. And I'm gonna put this question to you because I think it's important to, to bring into context um, our audience and why are we, we are organizing this art um, discussion. Um, so what do you see as the link between the misrepresentation of women and violence? Um, so you have two minutes each uh, so you can introduce yourself and then have your say. Uh, Catherine, would you like to start? Sure, thank you, Maria. Thank you very much for inviting me to this really urgent event, I think, a really urgent topic of conversation. Um, and I'm really grateful to be involved in it. So um, my book, which came out earlier this month, is called Women in the Picture, Women, Art and the Power of Looking. And essentially, it uses art history to try and open up discussions that are plaguing us in our wider um, contemporary moment. Um, each chapter of my book takes a different archetype. Um, I have the archetype of Venus, of mothers, of maidens and of monsters. And the one that's of most concern really for this evening is the chapter on maidens and dead damsels. So um, when I was researching this and thinking about depictions of sexual violence, 
I became interested in the way in which sexual violence within our shared visual language of culture has been normalized and also aestheticized and made into sort of trophies. Um, and I think in answer to the question, sort of what is this link between the misrepresentation of women and violence against women of, and girls, um, I think that um, as maybe I'll get a chance to talk about later on, ideas about consent that have become really troublesome in actually defining what rape and sexual violence is in a coherent way within legal language. And that means that justice um, is being performed adequately for victims of these crimes. Um, I think a lot of that confusion and inability to really decide uh, in concrete terms what rape is we can trace back to some of the images. I know Maria is going to talk about one in particular, um, some historical images that, you know, our history has argued about and said, oh, well, this isn't really a rape because it comes from classical mythology and we can't use those terms. Um, and I'm also interested as well in the aspect of um, colonization, the relationship between um, uh, colonial impulses and colonial violence and rape as a way of nation building. And that's something that I'll hopefully get a chance to talk about a little bit in some of the images that I've brought. Miranda, your turn. Hi, so it's really nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm actually going to be speaking from a personal point of view and showing some work that's created around gender-based violence. In terms of the link between misrepresentation of women and violence, I was considering this is a huge topic and it requires a lot of time to do service to it. I was thinking about which context are we talking about and also perhaps the absence of diversity in many representations, for example, can see, be seen as a misrepresentation in and of itself. For me, one link is uh, media and art is representations of women, how it normalizes. I think Catherine was touching on that. You talked about the aestheticization, but also the normalizing of violence against women. Uh, people become desensitized. Um, it becomes acceptable to see women in certain situations. Certain behaviours are seen as um, unchangeable, part of human nature, victim blaming, she asked for it, and the victim's blamed, not the perpetrator. This is still going on, and it's not go only going on in terms of looking at images, but also in terms of the institutions that are supposed to protect women. That I find really, really hard. Media reporting, which is important uh, to measure progress, um, the shifting of social and cultural norms, norms that can reinforce um, how we see women. Domestic abuse and femicide is um, often devaluing women and it, they write of isolated incidents and stranger danger. I'm going to be talking about uh, the context of domestic abuse. So Thanks. both sexual abuse very quickly and then uh, domestic violence. These are not single incidents often. This is systemic and it's embedded in institutions. So it's not just the media and images we're looking at, but the wider uh, systems that we need to look at and the extent of gender-based violence and the mechanisms of patriarchal culture, institutions, illegal institutions and the psychiatric ones that can reinforce, re-traumatize and re-victimize victims, women in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Rahima? Oops, uh, you are, yeah, mute. Thanks so much, everyone, for uh, joining in. And thank you, Maria, for inviting me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be part of this very, very important discussion. Um, so I'll be looking at it from sort of the angle of human rights and in terms of the ideas of I guess belonging. So my interest is in the rural landscape in Central Asia and South Asia, particularly in Central Asia, and the idea of belonging in terms of how women's hypersexualization, how the objectification of women, how you know how they've just been represented throughout Kyrgyzstan and across Central Asian countries, um, has led to you know ultimately the exploitation of traditional practices such as certain types of romantic kidnapping, acting, etc. And I'll be speaking a little bit about bride abduction and how we can look at the female form and 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 how the female body itself um, kind of ties in with the agricultural landscape and and male gaze and male belonging as well. Um, 
and and where where does where does the female voice uh, in all of this you know come into it and and what does that voice say um so that's kind of the angle i'll be i'll be taking and looking at sort of legislations and what's happening in kyrgyzstan right now and and across 18 other countries in the world where practices of bride kidnapping is common and and what does that say about the future of human rights from sort of a central asia outwards perspective um so yeah. thank you rahima and alinta Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I think um, my angle, so my work is around, well, uh, as she said, I'm um, co-founder of Bocantage, but it's also the, like, my work is around like looking at uh, mostly African art and also try to like, you know, uh, like, the col like the colonial gaze and so i think it's also for me uh looking at more like in, in to answer your questions about misrepresentation it's like misrepresentation because a lot of the imagery that we've seen of women especially uh of uh, around uh like africa or like south america or the like all the other part of the world have been colonized by the west has been image uh, uh, from the West and the misrepresentation of human is dehumanizing those people, they're dehumanizing. And when you dehumanize people, you're not giving them their full, you're not accepting them as individual. And when you're not accepting them as individual, then violence happen. So I think that's, for me, that's just the uh, straight thing I, I see. I just wanted quickly to read uh, a quote from uh, um, uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah. Uh, who said uh, in the honor code, they say, we human beings need others to respond appropriately to who we are and to what we do. We need others to recognize us as conscious beings and to acknowledge that we recognize them. When you glance at another person on the street and your eyes meet in mutual acknowledgement, both of you are expressing a fundamental, fundamental human need and both of you are responding instantaneously and without effort to that need you identify in each other. So I think it's all about also uh, recognitions, you know, being recognized for who you are. And uh, if you are misrepresented throughout art, and even like in general, then you're not recognized and you're prone to be victim of violence. I think that's... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's, it's clear that the represent misrepresentation comes from very different uh, perspectives. Uh, but the heart is the damage is that there is a detrimental effect on, on women as a, as a whole, yeah? Um, so we are going to talk now because I think it's important to look at the art in the past. Um, so, and, and then we will change about, we will switch, uh, we will talk about historical art now, and then we will uh, see some um, women uh, artists' responses um, about well, misrepresentation. So, Catherine, um, let's start by putting something to you. Your book, Women in the Picture, I've got it too. Um, and it is fascinating. I really recommend it. Um, takes the reader to some of the very well known paintings and painters and archetypes of, of women. And um, so you're imploring us in this book to take a deeper look, to, um, to basically um, get ourselves out of, of the composition, the color, the um, mastering of the techniques. So what has your research brought out about instances of physical and sexual violence against women in the art of the past? Mm -hmm. How common is it? And how does it tend to be depicted? And through, uh, from now, I'm going to share my screen because I think this our discussion needs to have um, needs to have um, some images. Can you all see? Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Um, thanks, Maria. So. Um, this, I mean, there's lots of images that I, we could have taken from the tradition of European art history, um, but this one seems to be something that allows lots of different ways out of it for thinking about the way in which these 
um, rape narratives or what's a mythological rape narrative have really been embedded into our political and cultural institutions in quite invisible ways. And as you said, I'm encouraging people to look beyond the way in which we get taught to see art in art galleries. If you go to um, any large collections, especially of pre-modern art, the idea is that it's, it's leisure, it's somehow thought to be good for you. You sort of get pushed along towards the cake shop, the cafe and the gift shop. Um, and I don't think we stop and do enough slow looking about what are the silent and very destructive messages that are being reinforced by this art that we revere as being, as having so much authority and having so much grandeur to it. So The Rape of Europa is a really good case study for thinking about this. So the story is a story that's as old as time, really. It's, um, it goes as far back as the ancient Mycenaean Greek culture, but it became um, sort of very pronounced within ancient Greek culture in I think about the 8th century BCE then was popularized by the Romans and then when Titian painted it in the Renaissance so in the 16th century um, the story was written down in a book called Metamorphoses and that was as widespread as you know something like the Bible people were as familiar with these stories as they would have been with the stories of Christianity so the story is about a Middle Eastern princess so um, modern day Lebanon was known as Phoenicia and uh, Europa was a princess from Phoenicia and she was abducted by the king of the Greek gods Zeus who has transformed himself into this white bull um, and he entices her he sort of um, uh, approaches her when she's as the story goes she's sort of playing on the beach with her friends and you can see them there um, on the shore of the beach in the in the corner I don't I can't I don't think you can see me using my cursor but I think you can see those those figures um, calling out to her um, and he kidnaps her and takes her off to the island of Crete and then as the story tells us he forcibly you know coerced her into sex and uh, she ended up having three sons and these three sons were then what was known as the start the first link in the European chain so the story of the rape and the male desire is taken as the propelling force to start this new civilization which became Europe so the first thing for me is that we've got this um, and this will relate to perhaps what some of the what Rahima and Alinta are involved in in this discussion is a direct, you know, rape at the heart of colonial strategy, rape at the heart of um, of this um, abduction from one continent and one culture to create another culture. So I think that's really important to remember. So um, she's being transported here. This story is sometimes called the, you know, the ecstasy of Europa. There's this always been this question mark in the way it's been talked about in art historical terms and in connoisseurship terms. And certainly when this painting went on show in the National Gallery in London last year, it was a bit stop start with the COVID pandemic and the closures. But this was thought of as being this spectacular, sensational moment when this painting from Boston came to London and was seen with a group of other paintings, some of which were also about race and they were produced for the Spanish king Philip II in the middle of the 16th century and no one was really talking about the sexual violence in here it had been pushed under the surface and all those things you were talking about Maria the you know encouraged to look at the use of colour and the storytelling and the and the and, and even the beauty of it um, and one of the key things within that was this idea does she like it or does she hate it you know is she writhing in ecstasy or is she twisting her back because she's struggling to get away and that i think for me is one of the key problems is this inability to recognize when no is no that is something that comes up a lot of the time this idea that no means yes or being helpless and struggling is somehow eroticized and that plays out in rape culture of today you know there, there are so many examples and we We'll all have examples that we can draw on that we've seen probably today in media or we've seen on Twitter or wherever. So how did that get transferred and conscious of time how did that get transferred that story which is about violence and colonial um, abduction 
and rape get translated into the symbol that represents the European Union. So we have this image is on the back of the two euro coin, you see there and an image, and it's also um, in a sculpture outside the Europa building in Strasbourg, so the central political building of the European Union and the European Parliament. Um, how that becomes neutralised and becomes sublimated into a symbol of political harmony, of pride, of cooperation and that's what I think is really troubling and if we can start to unpick the expectation that this rape and abduction can actually be turned into something else then maybe we might be able to confront some of the problems we have in sexual violence being taken seriously um yeah so I, I'm, I'm conscious that I don't want to go on too much but but I know I'm going to be coming back to talk later on but that's that's my key um my key example, and 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 also just I'll say quickly, I know Maria, you're going to talk about the rape of the Sabines and how that is, you know, another rape which is about building nations and building a foundation. Um, and even with something that appeared as an instructional image for women in their wedding, you know, at their weddings, it was something that gets seeded in um in very, very um secular and domestic ways. Sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, I was trying to, to pass the, the image. Um, yeah, um, it's, it's shocking. It's shocking that we enter in museums, in many museums, and we don't um, reflect deeply into what they represent in, because museums are supposed to be educational spaces, and, and it's shocking. And, and linking, um, um, the, um, the yes, the, the rape of um, Europa with um, the rape of um, Sabine women um, by Rubens um, is, I mean, is 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 quite the same. Um, Ten years ago, uh, when we started designing the tour, um, women at the National Gallery um, to rethink the history of art from a gender perspective. Um, we came up with uh, this painting that was quite shocking. And again, um, and again, as you said, is is again representing um, the rape. I mean, rape it means um, in that context um, meant raptio, coming from the Latin, which means abduction. But at, this, at the same time, is that it doesn't matter because if um, if you if you kidnap a woman, is because you have intention of raping her. So, so it's, it's quite the same. And again, this this story, this painting um, tells the story of of the Romans that they were kidnapping um, the Sabine um, Sabine women um to found um the the city in fact um um Sabine women um they were considered as mother as mothers of the of the, of the roman civilization and um so we can talk like through this painting um this painting is located at the national gallery in the rubens room is a big format uh painting and um, and and yeah, it's, it's amazing. The, the composition, the scores, the the color, um, is amazing. But um, but what is representing is very violent and distressing. And um, and what is the message uh, that a museum is giving to to people just to, to just describing the painting as as um, as a masterpiece. Um, so when we wanted to talk about this painting and the actual examples of what is happening in today's society, we came up with the stories like Boko Haram that kidnapped um, um, Nigerian women and, and then they, they raped them, they got them pregnant and then they give it back to their families and their families rejected them because of, of the um, of honor, uh, of a matter of honor. And, and then we came up with um, these um, practice in Kyrgyzstan. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let Rahima to speak about, um, about it, um, because I think Rahima, um, Rahima, as she said before, she has a, um, she, one of her projects is in Kyrgyzstan is to raise awareness about um, this practice that is happening in, in a small villages and small communities in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, even though it is forbidden, which is um, men um, kidnapping their future wives. Um, Rahima, tell us more about 
um, and and also. Um, um, what do you think about the contemporary significance of a painting like this? Uh, it must be very shocking for you. Um, you know what? I I I I'd prefer to say it's shocking for me, but it's it's not. It's it's you know it's expected and it's frustrating. Um, I, I think what, what yourself and you know Catherine mentioned in terms of sort of planned rape and planned abduction and planned abuse I think the idea of intention I think is really really important um so for example in Rwanda the Tutsi nuns they were raped in their churches in Bosnia the Serb military actually had sex camps and and took the Bosnian women and impregnated them so they could change the lineage of, of the Bosnian women's um, babies, uh, you know, with the Rohingya community, you know, they're the community that were pushed out of Burma and they live in the largest and most congested refugee camp in the world where you have 1 million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Um, and they were, for 60 years, um, there was a planned, you know, stages of genocide and planned violence where the women's body and, the, and, and women's voice and women's presence um, in the rural landscapes of Burma was seen as almost uh, as a tool where genocide was used, as rape was used as a tool of genocide, and, and they were seen as almost the direct, you know, reason um, and, 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 and sort of, um, how can I put it? They were used as a way to spread fear across the rural landscape of Burma and eventually um, by raping the women and by killing the women and also using them as sex slaves, they not only spread fear, they it pushed the community out of Burma and, and that was part of a stage of genocide. So I think to see a painting like this, um, we kind of reminded of, of that whole idea <laughs> Of, of intention of how the women, regardless of, of their strength, regardless of, uh, you know, their choice, um, are still somehow, you know, tied to the male gaze and the male intention. Um, so I've been working um, in Kyrgyzstan um, for the last, I mean, we, my organization is a human rights organization. We kind of occupy a strange space between both academic research, advocacy, and direct activism as well. And so we've been working across the world um, on human rights issues. And in my specific areas, we're looking at gender-based violence, looking at women's rights and girls' rights um, across the world. And I've been working um, in Kyrgyzstan and also other parts of Central Asia, both in Uzbekistan and Mongolia, across the borderland communities uh, between both as well. Um, and Central Asia for about 11 years now. Uh, my organization, Restless Beings, started a project back in 2010, um, working in Kyrgyzstan, looking at women who have been kidnapped and forced into marriage. Um, and I, I'm sure many of you have come across this sort of, it was once a cultural phenomena um, where women, you know, a boy and a girl liked each other, they told their families, you know, and then they had this sort of whole acting sort of, you know, reenacted this idea of um, romantically riding off into the sunset. And horses are a big simple symbol and also, you know, part of the agricultural um, life uh, in Kyrgyzstan. So they would ride off with their girlfriend on horseback and both families would bless this marriage. And so over the years, this has been kind of exploited and used um, in a way that kind of feeds into, I guess what you would say, populist narrative. So in the last sort of 70 to 100 years, um, what you what you see is an increase in bride abduction for all the wrong reasons. It's there, there's no choice. There's there's real intent in rape. There's intent in forcing and 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 oppressing a woman. And so at the moment now, as it stands, you know, 75% of women in the rural part of Kyrgyzstan have been married through uh, this non-consensual alakachu. It's known alakachu is known as kidnapping for marriage and non-consensual alakachu. So the term was romantic romantic before. A non-consensual alakachu is basically, you know, a woman who has no choice but was still kidnapped and forced into marriage. So 75% of, of Kyrgyz women um, in the rural parts of Kyrgyzstan. And then that's, you know, looking at almost one in five women across both rural and urban parts of Kyrgyzstan are kidnapped. And this could be anyone, a 16-year-old girl walk, walking to college um, and she's, you know, seen by a guy and he might be with his friends in a car and they'd kidnapped her. I mean, the most recent case was in April um, and it, it, a young lady, 27 year old lady um, who was kidnapped and then two days later her body was found and she was killed and she was kidnapped by a group of boys of which I think one of them wanted to marry her, saw her, had been following her, uh, kidnapped her 
And then um, she was killed. And this, this then led to a, a series of protests which took place last month and, the, and then start, start of this month, um, asking the president uh, of Kyrgyzstan and, you know, to change the legislations. I mean, at the moment, my, my work has been predominantly looking at the region, observing and also working towards directly affecting the legislation. So for the first few years of our work, we were focused on making sure that we could spread as much information as we could nationwide. So we worked with a film director, created a short advert. The image that you see out of the four images on the top top left um, is actually um, from that advert. Those, those are actors. Um, so that's not a real image. That's actually directly from our site. And um, those, those are friends of ours who reenacted the whole bride kidnapping situation. And we created a one minute advert, an advert that we, would, we managed to get the agreement from um, national TV to get it spread everywhere. This started a conversation and within three years as an organization with the support of some local organizations in Kyrgyzstan, we were able to change one legislation. So it was the punishment of, of uh, uh, those who had uh, kidnapped. So for example, if you kidnapped uh, cattle or sheep, you know, you would get X number of years in prison. So that could go up to 11 years. If you kidnapped a woman, you might not even get a few days, maybe max two to three years. Um, and that's if there was murder involved. So you can just see, you know, livestock, you know, a cow, a chicken, a sheep um, was far more important and still is to some degree um, than the, the female, the female, the woman, the female body, you know, it's the sheep over the female body. And so what we did was the first thing that we did was address that. And so we've managed to, in a few years, take that up to the same degree. So it's 11 years now and it's now a criminal act. There's been a change of leadership since. And so now our focus is to ensure that where it happens the most, which is the rural landscape in both Osh, Karakol, across the borders of Uzbekistan and Mongolia and China, those are the areas where it's, it's on the increase. We are working in those areas to try and say, look, listen, guys, this is an issue not, you know, let's stop this victim narrative of the female body. Let's look at the boys. Let's look at the young men. Let's look at the intent. Let's look at how they're looking at women. And let's also try and understand why they do it. Do they really want to do it? And, you know, we work in schools and we started young, basically. So we, we speak to 10 year old boys who say, well, look, my mom and grandmother they got married through forced abduction. And, and this is how, this is all we know. And if I don't marry a girl in that way, if I don't kidnap someone and marry them, then I'm not a real man. And that's the narrative that we're trying to unpack. And, and so, so we're starting with the boys uh, and that's kind of where I'm at. So um, that's the work that we do. Uh, there's a long way to go. Um, the, the noise is getting louder. Uh, university students up and down the country are saying more, they're protesting. Um, and there is the leader said last two weeks ago, ago uh, the current president of Kyrgyzstan said you know the murder of the 27 year old woman he, he said let this be the last time this happens in my country so we're hoping that some changes will take place um, and yeah that's I hope Thank I haven't you, Rahima. um yeah is yeah is 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 very shocking um, that these practices are carried and as well like I put some pictures as well with the um, with the Kyrgyzstan one because this is happening in many other ways and it's so ingrained in our culture that we don't realize. Uh, we don't realize that we are giving our visual consent um, to, to um, get to, to this fact of uh, abduction or kidnapping, uh, for example, the advert of Dolce & Gabbana that was so um, controversial back in the time um, shows in a sexy way um, rape gun, for example, or for example um, the um, trend of getting married and, and doing this theatrical act of kidnapping um, using arms as well is quite shocking too. And if we want to go to the basic through Seven Brides uh, for Seven Brothers, for example, that was inspired in the rape of seven women. Um, so, and the answer is education, education, education. We need to re-educate. We need to re-educate in relationships and to re-educate in the way women are perceived. As you were saying, now is, is like the lives is, even the value is, is less like livestock, isn't it? So um, yes, we need to change the narrative. And um, thank you, uh, Rahima, because your work is very important. Very important. So now, in a brighter note, um, oops, 
in a brighter note, um, um, I would like to to um, to invite Alinta. Um, in, oh, you're connected again. Okay, yeah. because you told me that your internet crashed. <laughs> I would like to invite Alinta to continue with um, with this topic. Um, we talk about um, we talk about a women's body um, as um, as a space of warfare. Um, we talk about conquest and, and the legacy of colonialism. But now, um, Alinta, can you take us? Um, um, through different artists um, that responded um, to, through their artwork um, to this legacy of colonialism. How do we decolonialize um, these, um, this um, visual um, history? Yeah. <laughs> we still decolonize. How do we do that? It's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing and a very I had to one. unlearn what I've learned. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so I think like uh, I've I've chosen three. Uh, I had a lot of a lot of them in mind, but I, show, I chose three artwork. And the one thing, the first one that you're seeing at the moment is from Uche Okeke, uh, like a, uh, it's an, a Nigerian artist. And I think it's really important because when you talk about decolonizing, uh, when we talk about modernism in in uh, in African art, I mean, for, like you know, in general. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take here the example of Nigeria because you know there are 54 countries in on the continent, so specifically in Nigeria, uh, modernism. When modernism hap happened in 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 uh, in Africa, it was because modernism in the West, uh, uh, like in Europe, uh, corresponded to like industrialization, like breaking from academicism. This is what we call the modern period when we make the break. But if we think about like uh, uh, like in Africa, it was also it was a way to decolonize the mind. And the artist I'm presenting here, like the work of the artist I'm presenting here, is Oshio Okeke, who is part of the natural synthesis movement, uh, which was born out in Nigeria, which was a movement was it was about decolonizing the mind because it was uh, talking about uh, synthesizing the old and the new. So. Uh, taking from what was there, so the African, so it was on a break from some African tradition. It was taking, uh, taking uh, those African tradition, but also uh, uh, using modernism. So like painting, because, you know, those work wasn't, you know, wasn't available at that time. And Uche Okeke uh, uh, is interesting because he developed a practice called Ulism, where he uh, used uh, Uli, uh, which is a form, uh, art practice by women, in houses in Igbo, in the, from the Igbo uh, ethnic group in Nigeria, and he developed this practice. This is not the case here, but this is what he developed, and so uh, and influenced all the artists. Uh, this image, uh, this artwork that I've chosen about the Abba revolt from Uche Okeke, uh, it is important because a lot of the modernist art, uh, African artists, they've actually showed the woman and the African woman as a symbol of uh, power, as a symbol of bringing together, you know, of Africanness, something to be proud of. And in this uh, uh, painting, the Abba Revolt, the Women's War, is referred to the uh, Women's Revolt in 1929 against the British authorities, because in the, in the, uh, with British colonization, you had the British rules and they imposed taxes, they were imposing taxes on women before the taxes was, uh, was imposed on men, but they were also imposing taxes on women, which means that they will, uh, the women, because we have this perception that the African woman of the, uh, was submissive, but the African woman, the Igbo woman, they were working in the marketplace, so they were making some earning. And uh, the colonial administration wanted to, uh, to tax them. So it meant that their income, which was helping also their household, would be uh, affected. So they started to protest. And, uh, and uh, so the protest, uh, the protest around the region, and they actually even, uh, you know, destroy some buildings, uh, etc. They were protesting. And so this painting is a reflection of that because we see the face of the woman, like, you know, uh, obviously angry, uh, bare and uh, like uh, naked, half naked. And that's what is interesting here because their nakedness is not about oppression, it's all about rebellion. They are actually showing their rebellion. This is their body, they are showing their body, but they are showing their body in sense of like uh, to be, to, to, to fight the colonial power, to fight the authority, what it represents. And that was one of the start, 
for the starting rebellion against British rules. So the women were at the core of uh, like decolonizing the decolonizing uh, of the colonial, uh, the anti-colonial fight. And I think that's what is, is also interesting in, the, in this painting because he's using, he's, he's representing women in another way. I mean, they are naked, they're half naked. They are, uh, they are, you can see their breasts and breasts is also about power. You know, they are the, they are the providers, but they are not naked because they have been uh, oppressed. They are naked because they are half naked, if you want, because they want to fight for their, for, for their right. And I think, uh, it's interesting coming from because he's a man, <laughs> you know. So, so from a from a main point of view, because it's also put like changing the perception of women, changing the perception of African women had not necessarily been something they were at the heart also of uh, the anti-colonial fight, uh, and I think that's why I take uh, I took from uh, this paint. It's very interesting. It's very interesting what you what you were saying. Um, it's true that um, women um, in lands uh, that were colonized were represented as a exotic product mm -hmm. to consume. We've seen this with African women. We've seen this with Gauguin paintings. That mm -hmm. is the first reference that comes up into our minds. And um, and then how this translates in today's tourism. Uh, for example, like for statues, um, yeah, so let's go to Thailand. So women are included in these holidays packages many, um, many, many times and they are consumed as part of, um, you know, like, um, like the package. Yeah, you just come to this boat and there are women, there are uh, free drinks and, and it's, it's, it's very shocking. So it's very interesting how, um, yeah, how it is, this painting is very empowering. Um, in many ways, but talking about, uh, do you have? Can I pass to the next slide, Alinda? Mm -hmm. Can I pass to the next slide? Yes. Yeah. Um, because I think it's very interesting. Um, uh, this one, yeah. Yeah. So I uh, this 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 one is from Uria Nyati, so an uh, Algerian-born uh, painter, uh, painter, uh, artist, visual artist. She's a multimedia. Artist. She's a singer, artist, poet. Uh, and uh, I like this work because it's uh, taken is uh, interpretation of the woman of Algiers. And so we talk about British colonial rule, we're going to like French colonial rules because she's looking, she is from her perspective of being Algerian. So she, just to give a brief bio, she was born in 1948. Uh, so she lived under uh, French uh, colonial, uh, like when Algeria was part of uh, was part of France. So she also lived the Algerian War, which is a traumatic still today because we're still talking about it today in between Algeria and France. It's a trauma in both uh, in both countries. So she 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 comes from this history. And at twelve, she was arrested because she was put like uh, uh, for put in uh, graffiti, anti-colonial graffiti. So she was put in jail uh, also. Uh, at 12 years old. So she lived through that experience. And uh, the whole, uh, uh, this artwork, No to Torture from 1982, is, uh, as, you, as we've seen after the Lacroix Woman of Algiers. And this is an installation. So this is only the painting here, but this is an installation. So you have the five, yeah, five paintings, but you also have postcards on the installation, a postcard that you could see at that time in the, in the 19th century, those postcards. Uh, who represented like, you know, kind of an exotic uh, Algeria, like with the, 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 the woman, like the landscape, like really exotic. And also in the installation, she's, she's singing. So why she's talking, uh, why she's uh, talking about the woman of Algiers, because Delacroix is an orientalist and he was, he painted the woman of Algiers in the RM. So he went to a space was prohibiting to men. So he enters space, so he's already violating the space that is uh, for, for women. And you've seen those women in the, in the original painting with like all their jewelry, uh, all their, uh, you know, fully clothed, all their jewelry. And here she changes the narrative, she's not changing the narrative, but she's basically saying like from what she's unveiling what we are not seeing. So mean that this uh, woman of Algiers from Delacroix is already a form of uh, oppression of the woman because although he because first of all he's entering a space that is not supposed to be for for him and also they are exoticized they are not 
they are not uh, empowered, they are exoticized. So what we see in those paintings is like they are fully naked. We can't see their face. They are in the, in the same, especially in the central one, they are in the exact position that you've seen in the, the Lacroix painting, but you can see that they are uh, like one of the women in blue, their arm is missing. You can't see their face. Their face is, uh, is uh, you have a cross kind of like a graffiti or like even if you look at the woman in green, uh, it's like, like a cage. So they are, it's what we actually see. This is, so it's a criticism of Delacroix painting, but it's also a criticism of what the French did in Algeria because a woman, uh, the Algerian women were also oppressed. They, uh, they were oppressed, but they were also um, uh, subject to torture because that's one of the issues the, with the Algerian war is like, you know, the French army did torture uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Algerians. So you see in all the, in the painting on the side that, you know, the way they are uh, tied there, you know, so this is what's reflecting and even the color because they are vibrant color, but they are also scary colors. It's like, you know, those red color, those green colors. So it's, it, it, it makes you, it creates a discomfort, which is opposite to what we see in the women of Algiers, which are exoticized and, you know, it looks pretty, but here they force the, 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 the painters, forcing us to look at it as a sense of discomfort that we should actually feel when we look at the women of Algiers. So it's unveiling really what we not like what is in the painting so it's not to torture uh, it's a uh, it's a critique of the lacroix but it's also a critique of the uh, of the how the body of women was oppressed and the one thing is interesting is like if you think about the french uh the french uh colonization they've actually i think it was in 1950 1953 or something the the french army unveiled women in algeria they they say unveiled women so to show that you know to to lead, to liberate them from their oppressive you know the oppressions of you know like of islam or whatever but if you think about it they were unveiled but also it means that you can see their face and one thing that we need to to uh, to, to know is like during the Algeria war, during the fight for liberation, the women that were there, they were also part of the fight because they could hide anything. So, you know, by unveiling them, you making them recognizable by the, by the, by the French authority. So it, it, it shows the, 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 not the paradox, but the hypocrisy of colonization, which was about liberating women, supposedly uh, bringing civilization, but actually what they were bringing was oppression in a different way. So that's, yeah. I think that's the, if I'm really quick, that's the... Yeah, the yeah, idea. yeah. Well, uh, French, they need to rethink uh, what freedom and oppression uh, means uh, for the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the values applying uh, to other cultures in terms of colonization needs to be uh, rethought. Um, yeah. Um, shall I go to the next one? Rosa yeah. Paulina? So, so Rosanna Paul, uh, uh, Paulino is uh, Atlantico Vermelho, so Red Atlantic, uh, and it's a uh, it's a uh, work uh, from a Brazilian uh, uh, Brazilian artist. So I would say Afro Brazilian because I think that's important. Uh, why? Because uh, Brazil, I think there were five million enslaved people brought to Brazil. So after Nigeria, Brazil is the country with the highest black populations. There are more than 50% of the population in Brazil that is black, black. But what's been also throughout history in Brazil, what was perceived as like, uh, what was brought out to the public is like a racial uh, democracy, which is not because there is a lot of racism and there is a lot of uh, discrimination, but the major, like actually the majority of the country is black. And so what she's uh, looking at here, this is called Atlantico Vermelho, which is Red Atlantic. She's inspired by like the Black Atlantic from Paul Gilroy, uh, which is about, you know, how there is a connection between Africa and the America and the diaspora in Europe and the creating cultures uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the diaspora, like the Atlantic. Uh, and so here she put the Red Atlantic because what she's pointed out is like how the Atlantic was also uh, uh, there were a lot of blood that came out of the Atlantic because of, uh, of slavery. And she's using those uh, pan, like those panels that she saw to, together to show the memory, the history that is hidden, the history that we don't want to talk about. So it's like, uh, you know, it's, um, 
like this memory. And you see at the center, like, so you have the Atlantico Vermelho, but you have the Azulejos, like the, which are, you know, Portuguese, so reminds you of the Portuguese colonization, but those images as well, you see images of like, uh, uh, enslaved, the enslaved woman with the child, the, the boat that took the, the enslaved. And what is interesting is like the way she, uh, they, are, uh, they are printed on the, on the fabric, but they get a feeling of being like x-ray, like images. So uh, it's also reflect to this, like the science behind uh, slavery, the science behind colonization, the science beyond uh, like uh, the fact that uh, the hierarchy of the races, there was a whole science behind it. So that's what it refers to. But what is it, what I found particularly uh, important in her work is like the images that she uses, they are not from Brazil, they actually the images of the woman and the child, I think is from Cuba. And what she said is that those images were circulating all over the Atlantic about representation of, you know, uh, of, of, of the South America, the, uh, the America, which means that also it dehumanized people because they are they are not humanized because you cannot see their face you can see that in all the portrait like the 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 photograph printed you cannot see the face but also it shows that you use something that happened in Cuba to represent Brazil or to represent North America meaning that you're not thinking about the humanity and and you put everything the black body as the same you know this is the other you know and especially the body of the of, of the of the woman and the woman is not even um, taken in consideration here and the black woman, which is uh, the black woman is important in the African, uh, in the Brazilian uh, society. So I think what she's trying to show here is to, uh, to, uh, to, to actually, um, yeah, challenge those, this history, challenge those stereotypes that we have and to, show us in, in a way it's the same as Orianetti to for us to be to have a sense of discomfort to see this history that we want to hide uh, to see those bodies that we want to hide and to see the violence that was made to those body and that's why you have also the thread the red thread that symbolizes the blood so yeah it's, it's very important um, that uh, we put ourselves in context and um, mm -hmm. in the western country context as being part of what happened um, in, in, well, in Africa and afterwards in, in all these countries where slaves were brought um, to. So important, so important to reread um, all, all these images. And on the same note, ah, is it not working? Oh, no. Okay, sorry. Um, on the same note, um, continuing um, with um, um, the um, continuing with the scrutinizing um, the gaze um, of the old masters and um, the colonization and so on, um, I think is is very important to present some um, some artists, um, some women artists, and that and their responses. Um, to this uh, particular violence, type of violence. Um, so these images were chosen by Catherine. Catherine, are you? Yeah, yep, I'm here. Thank you. Um, great. Um, thank you. Sorry, were you going to say? Um, I was just, I just wanted to say thank you to Alinta for that really enlightening um, talk and that overview. And also Rahima, I'm just blown away by you know, the work that you're doing. And also what I'm blown away by is my own ignorance. And that's something that I wanted to raise within this topic is that we're talking about issues that the West or um, I don't know, sort of here in London or here in the UK or in Europe or wherever people might be tuning in from, we have this invisibility as to the extent of what's happening, the genocide and the gender violence. And I wonder if there is a connection between the fact that we can walk into galleries, we can look at currency and coins, and we don't see 
the gender violence that's there. And I wonder if there's a, some kind of connection there. Um, and also, I think it raises the issue of the importance of women artists and the invisibility of women artists, because women artists that Alinta was talking about, this is work of protest, but it's work that is falling into the margins and it's remaining in the margins because the art that we still privilege and the art that gets sold on the art market, the majority of, um, you know, uh, large scale shows and retrospectives are by white male artists. I mean, that is just a fact. And it's the European American tradition of white male artists and that canon. And so I think one part of the activism as practitioners within the arts is opening up the visibility for women's voices who are responding to these issues to make those more immediate and to make those more visible so that people know these names, so they know you know, who these women are and the images that they're creating. So the things I'm going to look at are a bit second wave feminism. I know the second wave of feminism has um, some problems which we can't go into at the moment, but the ones that I'm, I'm going to talk about are some women from the second wave feminist movement who started to respond to rape um, in the United States, and then also one woman of colour, Faith Ringgold, also an American artist, um, to show that there is a difference in how, there's differences and similarities in how this issue can be tackled from different viewpoints. So the first work, which is a work that was a performance piece created by Judy Chicago and Suzanne Lacey, uh, also with another a couple of other women, Sandra Orgville as well was involved in it, um, and some other students of Judy Chicago's um, at Fresno University, where she set up the first feminist art study program in the early 70s. And this work called Ablutions was a performance in an auditorium where guests were invited to sit down, there was dark lighting, and there was a recording playing uh, the words, I felt so helpless, all I could do was lie there, I felt so helpless. And it was the testimonial of a woman who had been raped um, and there were so the series of audio recordings of other women's confessionals so that first um, aspect of um, healing that it's sometimes talked about is you know is the expulsion of that trauma or vocalizing it and also sharing it and creating the narrative so owning the narrative of what has happened so that was part of the second wave women's movement of the importance of narration and the importance of sharing um, and storytelling of one's own narrative um, and then you can see here, this is just a, you know, uh, an image from lots of a much longer piece that went over a long dura longer duration, women bathed in tins of animal blood and clay and raw eggs, uh, you can see the, the cracked eggshells and that quite, you know, bizarre scene at the back there against that white wall it was actually um, uh, kidney from kidneys from from uh, you know offal animal offal that you can buy in the butcher was being hammered onto these white walls so it was something that really engaged with the disruptive violence of the body being broken open um, of being sort of steeped in um, in 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 you know in in pain and steeped in trauma and the central woman there is being wrapped up like a mummy in bandage. And so the performance ended with women sort of suspended within a kind of web that had trapped and silenced them as an indication of the networks that, that sort of silence women's ability to, to talk about this and these things that we're dealing with. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah. So. Oops. It happens to mine all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I start it and then it will. Um, yeah. yeah, it happens to me all the time. Anyways, um, um, Margaret Harrison. Yes, so then back in the UK, then I wanted to show this work because this one really makes emphatic the point that our cultural images that we prize and we give authority to and extreme value to, the relationship between them and um, actual gender violence. So along the top tier of the image, Margaret Harrison, by the way, is a British artist who was she she was famous for creating a series of drawings that the police shut down. It was of Hugh Hefner, the Playboy Bunny, 
the head of the, you know, the founder of the Playboy Enterprise and Empire, yeah. him dressed up as a bunny, sort of in the traditional bunny girl outfit. And in the early 70s, this exhibition was shut down and the and and the images were seized by the police. And I think that's really interesting if we look at how we took at that time and arguably still today, if we try to represent men in the same demeaning terms that women have traditionally been represented, then it becomes a visible problem and it becomes something that is considered obscenity. So she's someone who's really interesting to look up in that regard if people are interested. So along the top tier, you can see there's a number of Im images taken from the highlights of art history. We've got um, uh, on the left, we've got the Judgment of Paris, which is the famous beauty competition from mythology where three goddesses all display themselves um, uh, competing to see who a mortal man will decide is the most lovely and the most fair so this idea of women competing one another for a male gaze and um, in the middle you've got the famous painting of Ophelia by uh, Millet of Ophelia the Shakespearean heroine who drowned um, and uh, was treated misogynistically within that story and you have Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe so images of sort of female objectivity you've got Andromeda changed to a rock naked. So at the end of that top tier, there's an advert which was a contemporary advert found in magazines for orange juice. And it shows a woman in like a tight bikini and underneath it says juicy, fruity and cheap. And that was the tagline for selling this product. So she's drawing a relationship between the images of high culture and the images of everyday culture, which is very much what my book is what I try to do in my book for, for now, for the 21st century. On the tier below that, you can see newspaper cuttings. So those are newspaper cuttings that either prop up traditional ideas of masculinity. And I was interested in what Rahima was saying about um, how men define being men is by being abductors and rapists, because that becomes ingrained as a cultural aspiration of how to define one's masculinity. Um, but also it has um, a, real, you know, genuine media coverage of um, judicial bias within rape trials. So comments that were made by judges um, saying things like, uh, well, uh, you know, everyone knows that women and young men are prone to making things up and prone to fantasy um, and these kind of travesties, travesties of justice and mistrial that took place um, uh, in cases of sexual violence in the 1970s. And then beneath that, you have the violence of the weapons that are a really threatening reminder of the, you know, how, um, how, gender violence is something that is weaponized and something that um, is incredibly, you know, physically harmful. So you have this coming together um, for us to look, it's all, I like the way it's laid out almost like it's a dissecting table or it's like a table of evidence that you might have within a court case setting and asking us to make these connections between advertising as I said, the objects and images of female objectification and denigration that we invest so much of our cultural authority in, um, and also real time and real life um, occurrences of gender violence. Um, so I think the next slide is Faith Ringgold, if I'm correct. So then we have Faith Ringgold operating from a, from, um, a different perspective. So she used the, so she moved away from um, um, a Western art historical tradition of displaying images of rape as mythological and heroic storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just have the one woman in the scene, uh, rather than watching a scene take place, we as the spectator take the place of the implied rapist. So she stops us from being a voyeur who can comfortably look at something like Titian's Rape of Europa and go, oh, well, maybe she's actually really enjoying it. And we get some kind of erotic thrill from considering that. Um, she puts the spectator in the uncomfortable position of being a rapist, as is suggested within the context of a plantation um, we have the, she was, a, uh, you know, she's an, she is, she's still alive, she's an artist 
who considered herself part of the Afrofem centrism movement. So um, from what I have read about Ringgold and she's recently become celebrated. Uh, she had an exhibition at the Serpentine in London and she's definitely become more celebrated in the United States in recent years, but it has taken until she's in her seventies and eighties, you know, it's taken this amount of time. And I think that's another thing to recognize about the marginalization and um, invisibility of women artists, especially when they're is to do with activism um, of this nature that they very often don't get you know public recognition until they're almost at the end of their lives um, so like I said she as an as a woman who was expounding this movement of Afrofem centrism she talks about how she felt the story of slavery um, had centered around the figure of the of the black man of the of, of, of a male story and a male drama and she said she wanted to tell the female perspective or the women's perspective and very sadly Margaret Harrison is still alive yeah um very um you know as we know the rape was a very um you know pronounced means of controlling populations of enslaved people who had been taken from Africa and to colonies and there's lots of work as well that celebrates that that I've discussed in my book so sort of, um, horrible prints that um, sort of romanticize that so her work is a, is a riposte to that she also uses her own features and the features of her daughters um, and she was descendant from an enslaved African woman um, and so we get this idea of the genealogy of trauma as well of how rape gets carried on and you know there's within discussions of trauma um i know it's not it's not my field directly but i know that there is this idea of inherited trauma and how things are carried along generationally so um her work can be seen as a way to draw attention to that and maybe as a way of exorcising that and by that i mean as a way of you know releasing it um, she borrows from tibetan um um image making so the the traditional term for these that you can see this sort of there's silk patches of there's there's painting but then it's bordered with these um uh, sewn silk quilt like uh framework um so those were inspired by um tibetan buddhist uh, meditation silks and wall hangings um and um it's just i think it's a it's an, it's a really amazing work i talk about it in my book and i think it's it is um one that is both empowering and i was interested again in what alinta was saying where you have the nude body not as something as with the other women and the women's revolt it's not about uh, new it's kind of reframing our idea of nudity as oppression um even though we know the horrific outcome of this implied narrative that this woman is going to be raped um there is still her body is proud and especially with the glinting axe next to the pregnant belly in the last scene there um this kind of very a surprising juxtaposition of the swell of the burgeoning pregnant belly and then that sharpened axe and this sort of self-determination to protect oneself and to fight back um, and I think that is sometimes you know we, we mentioned a little bit about these victim narratives and um, you know I don't at all think that women should have to be that women cannot identify as victims that's not what I mean at all I think that women should be able to identify as victims if they want to um, but it also changes that narrative as well which in, in an interesting way it sort of takes it away from the victim and uh, makes it a little more can we say empowered I don't know but puts her in a different position I think those were the three images I had Maria I can't okay. did I have another one there um, I don't think so. That was those three. So those are, yeah, so those are all from, from a, a similar moment. Oh, in the, yes, it's Susan Lacey. So I'll quickly talk about this one because this one is interesting for how it did remove itself from an art gallery setting. So um, the previous three images all were works that, that were shown within um, community, an art community. So the first one, the performance, it was 
people who were invited within a university campus who were involved in some way in the, in, in in artistic production or the study of art um, and then Faith Ringgold's and Margaret Harrison's were both works that were made to be in galleries. I should have mentioned actually that the rape piece by Margaret Harrison was not allowed to be shown in the Serpentine Gallery in the 1970s because it was um, considered to not be appropriate from a family setting and that again raises the question but it's okay to have a mythological rape by Rubens in a family setting and probably even family workshops that revolve around it in these institutions so that's something that I think requires rethinking within collections um, so this work was different because it broke outside of that framework of the museum or gallery or specialist um, audience and Suzanne Lacey um, at the time LA in 1977 was named as the rape capital of the USA um, and she put two big topographical city maps into an underground shopping center that was very close to city hall so next to the center of of politics and legislation etc and the people who should be caring about this um, and she um, was in communication with the LA police department and every time a rape was reported she put a red stamp saying rape on the location on the map so what she did this was over the course of three weeks and then you see how this map kind of it starts to erupt a bit like a wound is erupting and the the map the the topography underneath becomes obscured by these moments of rape in red so obviously drawing on this idea of the violence and sense of blood and um, but for every um every rape that was reported she also put another nine stamps around it with the assumption that you know, not every act of sexual violence is reported um, and with the anticipation that for everyone that did get reported to the police, another nine were happening. So she, uh, she drew on some certain statistics. And what I think is interesting about this, and again, it points to this idea of visibility and how these issues need to be made visible and how do we make them visible and how do we work together in our various different fields of humanitarian work as artists, as activists, as curators, as art historians, as lecturers, educators, um, how do we make this visible and I think what the point she makes here very well is that the more times the stamp is put on the harder it is to read the word so it becomes obscured and so the more times something happens the more normalized it becomes and the harder it is for us to see it for what it really is and um, taking action either right um the proper action to like to stop it so there's an ongoing um yeah like rape uh, culture. Yeah. Um, well, Catherine, thank you very much. I need to, um, to introduce um, the works of Miranda. Uh, Miranda is herself um, an art activist. Um, I'm just conscious about the time we're running behind. Everything is so interesting and we can talk for, for ages. Um, um, Miranda, are you, are you here? Yeah. Yes. I'm ready and I will try and be quite quick. So oh, thank you. That would be uh, very good if we've got um, I'm going to try, uh, the Q&A. I, I feel like I'm taking a little bit of a departure in terms of um, the way we're reflecting on work created by other people. So I'm going to own this. This is work I've created over a period of time from when I was 24, I'm 56 now, and various threads of work that have become apparent to me in hindsight that what I've been looking at is a domestic war zone. So I also put at the, at the heart of some of this, the family, family institutions, home, and given the COVID pandemic, that people aren't safe at home. I think statistics show that most violence against women is perpetrated by current or former partners. So I um, take this position and I'm gonna speak from kind of the heart I don't have all the answers, but I'm reflecting back. Before I start, which I have, just for a minute, have a look at this image. And I'm gonna say a bit of intention, the discourses that we have to understand, we've all been interpreting images, giving uh, narratives, giving intents and explaining. I'll give you a little explanation. I was 24 when I created this image as part of my final year project at university studying photography. 
Questions of interpretation, as we've heard, rely on dominant discourses, art history, how to read images. I was around a lot of popular culture, the street, music. I had access to magazines, album covers, friends. That's how I learned about things. What are the cultural histories, the systems of power and the ways of seem, to name a few? And also notions of authorship. So I'll ask you, who made this? Why and how? Now, imagine, what if a man had created this image? Does it change how you see it? It's impossible for me to read this image objectively. I can provide some insights into its creation. At the time I was silent, but my subconscious was not. It was pushing up through the images I created. Representations of gender-based violence ebb through the work. The mannequin is covered in black plastic bags which are held in place by the kind of string that's used to bind meat. The breast and genital areas have been ripped open to expose the flesh beneath, while the square frame is layered with fissures emanating from the torso. Her head is covered, her face concealed. She is anonymous. At the time, I was silent, but my subconscious was not. It was pushing up through the images I constructed, and I couldn't talk about it. I was in an institution, an academic institution, I was able to talk about work, but I could not talk about this. It took me so many years to be able to. In making the image shot on color transparency in a studio, I made intervention, an act of rebellion and anger. I took the glass that's meant to shield and protect the image and I smashed it, then I replaced it. I had no idea that this image would be the catalyst for the subsequent disclosure of child sexual abuse I'd experienced at home and the subsequent series, Home Discomforts, which I wrote about for Shiro's in the reading corner. When I created this image, was I unwittingly re-victimizing myself? With hindsight, no, it was a catalyst and it helped towards disclosure. It literally erupted. And anyone who's into psychoanalysis or Freudian interpretations can go where they want with it. Was it cathartic to act out this violation on a mannequin as if it were a stand-in? Yeah. In so doing, I propelled myself onto a path that ultimately had nothing to do with art or the appreciation of the aesthetics of an object. It was a deeply personal political gesture for me. There was no intent for this to ever land on anyone's wall, in any gallery, I just created it. The importance of the role of creativity in helping to acknowledge and heal trauma is so important to all my work. And it allows me to make visible what was hidden and to find voice to break years of silence. Further, the image is built on an assemblage of physical actions. Sadly, uh, the digital arena makes it look seamless, flattened, dull, two-dimensional. It's a digital rendering of an analog object and it will never convey the feeling of how I felt when I took the negative and I smashed the glass. Can we go to part two? Yes. I'm going to be quick and aside, at the time I was looking at the work of the surrealists who used mannequins, which is well documented, so I won't go into that. They put an exhibition in 1938 at the Galerie de Beaux-Arts in Paris, all of, for a number of artists, all of whom were men, there's Andre Masson's and Salvador Dali's contributions. In both the photo I created and in Masson's mannequin with its pansy filled mouth and burged caged head, woman is silenced and trapped, but in very different ways and for different reasons. For me, it was also about let's shut women up. And maybe we can move on. I've always liked the street, art galleries, institutions, they have their own way. You have to walk through the threshold in order to feel that you are part of them. The street for me is this liminal space between the public and the private. I never know who's gonna walk past. So many years later, I printed up 20 copies in 2014 and created a fly poster campaign using wheat paste. It's biodegradable by the way. And it's part of the Temps, a guerrilla street art show focusing on women and mental health. 
how art and creativity can harness as a transformative medium for healing. We created impermanent artworks, some of which were later removed the next day by the council. Installations and happenings, we were raised a second time there, on streets, pathways, using drawing, photography, film and performance. I hadn't titled this work until I did this. And when I did, I called it Fractured Self. So for me, another reflection on discourses around meaning and how they can be very slippery and subject to change. Can we go to four? I'm gonna be quick. Sorry about this. That's all right. It's Kira, if that is gonna go, no. Yeah. Decades later, I performed Joko Ono's cut piece following an assault by my farmer, former partner who was later convicted of assault occasioning actual bodily harm and he was sentenced accordingly. Here we can see Yoko Ono performing it for the first time in Kyoto in Japan in 1964. She asked the audience to follow a set of instructions. Performer sits on stage with a pair of scissors in front of him. Interesting, she says him, this shows the times we're in. It is announced that members of the audience may come on stage one at a time to cut a small piece of the performer's clothing to take with them. Performer remains motionless throughout the piece. Piece ends at the performer's option. And then maybe we go to the next slide. I'm gonna try and whiz through. In the context of domestic violence I experienced six years ago, I restaged the work, but in the context of raising money for a domestic violence charity, all the work that I've done that's personal and trauma-based is always done in the context within which I feel safe and supported. Unlike Yoko Ono, who sat on the floor with the audience looking down on her, for my interpretation of the domestic war zone, I sat on a stool, eyes at higher level than the audience, just one blinking eye looking out. I was wearing the grey sweatshirt and pants which I was given in police custody following my wrongful arrest. I'd created a DIY mask, plastered with skin sliced from beauty and fashion adverts in magazines, but with the addition of my black eye. The snipping of the skin and the cutting of the scissors echoed the performance. Further, in keeping with the theme of the performance, my undergarments are deliberately mismatched. White sports bra, big black knickers, gray knee length pop socks. As with most of my work, the process is as important as the outcome. And without audience participation, cut piece does not exist. In the aftermath of a violent assault, I tried to reframe my lived experience with participation. It could be interpreted as violent, but for me, it was an act of re-embodiment. It was a ritual and it was a letting go of the trauma and of the clothes. I dutifully washed these clothes that I'd worn in custody and they had blood on them, returned them to the police station only to be told they didn't want them. So I took them home and then reworked them. The mask allowed me some anonymity, unlike with Yoko Ono. I did not tell the story to anyone of what had happened to me. This was a narrative, and I think we need to think about this, dominant narratives and narratives we repeat ad nauseum about events. It was a narrative I'd repeated over and over to the police during a two hour cross-examination in Crown Court when the case went on trial in 2016. Instead, I was silent and sat there and I waited for the audience to find me and ask me, well, what happened? The performance is fluid. I can continue until I want to stop. Apart from the host for the who read the instructions, I was silent and still, and I sat there for 12 minutes as people cut away pieces of cloth to take with them. As part of the ongoing nature of the work, I gathered responses. As with Yoko Ono's performance, some of the participants who I asked afterwards felt very uncomfortable. They felt they were being implicated in what could be regarded as a potentially aggressive act because I was asking them to take pieces of clothing from me. Later, one woman told me her grandmother wanted her to tell everyone to stop, but no one would. So victim blaming became part as well of the theme that ran through this. Further, as John Berger writes in his hugely influential book, Ways of Seeing, 
there was the idea that I was watching myself and I was being split in two. And when I put together the movie footage of this, I had a handheld camera on a mobile phone and a tripod mounted camera. I tried to suggest the psychological splitting I felt after the assault and reworked it into the way I used the split screen in the um, document of the performance and in the editing. This was an attempt to evoke how I felt. Should we go to the next slide? I'll be trying to be quick. This work and the work I've just shown now became part of a group art exhibition showcasing the work of eight artists who had direct experience of, direct, of domestic abuse, including those who witnessed abuse as children. I curated the, uh, the show and also showed Cut Slice. The work includes photography, film, animation, performance, poetry and painting. We can see work here from Laura Noble, Crushing Trauma, who crushes trauma and paints, Lydia Lydia, who used Ken and Barbie dolls to create disturbing tableau showing scenes of domestic abuse in a bid to raise awareness of violence against women. The Middlesbrough Gallery had to take the work down because there were too many complaints from the public. Nobody wanted to see Ken and Barbie in this sort of situation. Passersby had complained because of their graphic content and it was visible to young children. We could also see Susan Young's work her autoethnographic approach harnesses the power of animation and self-reflection to engage with personal experience and heal trauma. And at the top, Ellen Nolan's quiet images and text series, which pairs still life images with entries from her diary documenting patterns of coercive control. All the perspectives are different. All of them are unique, but the role of abusive power and control, in this case, in the domestic context is central and shared. The violence associated with domestic abuse is often understood and depicted in terms of black eyes and bruises. Many campaigns use the same visual tropes to signify abuse. Children cowering in a corner with a shadowy figure looming in the background, or a woman sitting on a bed with her face in her hands being watched from another room. But not all abuse is physical, and forms such as coercive control are more difficult to portray. So I'm also interested in how we represent violence that is not necessarily physical, but is psychological and emotional and how far photography can go because in many ways it's limited. Context is crucial to all the work I produced. I try to do it in the sense of a fundraiser, to raise awareness and also to self-guard myself because in showing this work, it was not meant for the art market. It is not something that I necessarily thought would be made public, but if it can do anything to engage people in dialogue, and to talk about the family and the home, what is supposed to be at the heart of this, not from the outside, before we even get out of the door, then I hope I've done something. And I don't have all the answers at all. I'm learning as I go along, but I hope that we have some social change around these topics. Thank you, Miranda. That was amazing. That was very generous. First of all, I'm gonna stop sharing um, for now. Um, that was very generous because I think um, activist artists um, have this role of uh, having their say, express um, all this, I mean, express um, the discomfort, but also opening conversations, important conversations around topics, um, very important topics as violence against women and girls. However, they are not welcome in most of the galleries and especially in the commercial galleries and their spaces are very limited and, and as well the, 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 the income doesn't come from anywhere because um, is, is, it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to have, as you were saying, um, Barbie and Ken. Um, I love Lydia, Lydia works. Um, she is, she's part of this exhibition. She is very brave and is amazing. Her compromise and her commitment uh, with the cost. Um, anyways, I think um, we might not have questions. Um, so, um, we're running out of time, We've got one minute to finish, but I will take um, five more minutes so I can um, thank you and, and, and do and launch the, the last question. There is one question that I wanted to, 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 to ask you, um, but this is very brief. What can be done from the institutions? What can be done from the institutions? Is there anything do you want to answer? Um, 
Alinta, what can be what can be done from the institutions, from the art institutions, uh, from museums, from where galleries? I mean, be very brief, uh, but just just give us um, an idea of of what can be done. I was gonna say nothing, but no. What I'm what I'm gonna say is just I think probably what needs to be done. I think as a society to rethink uh, museums and gallery because I think the museum was created from anyway a patriarchal colonial perspective. So probably as a society we need to rethink ex what we want from art, and uh, so it's really uh, and uh, so I'm saying that although you know curated sometime in in galleries but i think we need to rethink that and probably what you said at the beginning i think education is really important is that the key uh, education uh, from from the beginning from a younger age education is i think uh, the key so to implement uh, in, in education and maybe changing our way of exhibiting so and like so of thinking exhibition and, muse and gallery and museums so those works the, such as the ones that we run that can be shown any other ideas? Rahima, would you like to say something about the things that can be done in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, a museum sets itself as, a, as a, almost a, a space for, you know, civil society to come and access art, you know, that's obviously curated by the museum heads. Um, and as Alinta mentioned, you know, we really do need to rethink how these spaces function for us and our lives and, and ultimately how we are embroiled in the, the, the gaze, the, the multiple gazes that the museum presents itself and through the art itself. But I think what the main thing I feel the main change is for museums to take a step of like actually step up and say, look, you know, we, 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 are, we have artwork that could possibly be problematic. And while we have communities across the world that are still fighting for accountability and justice um, and have experienced gendered violence, we as an institution publicly, you know, as a service for the public as well, um, consider that and want to have this discussion in our spaces, in our creative spaces that is also for the public. And so I think museums need to have workshops and discussions surrounding some of their artwork, especially if they have pieces that exhibit um, you know, women in, in multiple forms of violence. Um, and I think also museums need to really rethink um, what they are displaying to the public and why, and if they are deciding on something to actually explain why, both on their website, in their spaces. So especially for the young audience who, who will visit museums and will probably be socially conditioned like we did when we were 10 years old and visited a gallery with school. Um, so I think there's there's a great sense of responsibility that institutions need to start to exercise. I'm just going to say something really quickly. I think also institutions, not just in terms of the art, but they also need to look at how they're formed, look at what's happened with the Sacklers, now Goldie and calling out the Sacklers. They also have to look at how the structures, the hierarchies in terms of who they employ, how they make decisions, how they operate, and then we've got the work that they put out there, but they have to go right, dig deep, deep down into the structures and the ways that the structures also bullying, harassment, not letting people be part of the institutions. That has to change. It has to change. And this gap between high art and popular culture, even the fact that we're using those words still, I would say, why are we still doing that? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. why are we still saying this? Yeah. High and low culture because it, 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 it silences so many people who feel they cannot even enter the rarefied domain of high culture. Yes, um, there is a lot of work to do. There is a lot of work to do. And um, yeah, it's a shame that we run out of time. All the interventions, you were fabulous. You were amazing. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine had to go. Um, because she has um, a child of three uh, years old, so she had to go. Um, but yeah, but the four of you were amazing. So thanks to Aline, to Miranda, Rahima, and, and Catherine for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your um, personal experiences, as well as, as, as activists and as artists um, and as women, uh, really. Um, so we... Um, I think the, the, the Shiro's mission um, couldn't be done without the amazing art, uh, artists, women artists um, that present their work and talk about them in an insightful way. 
um, is amazing. So um, before um, everybody start leaving, um, I just want to make sure that uh, you see the link for this survey that we've got this survey, if you um, open it and did you respond it afterwards, um, your questions, your answers will help us uh, to get more funding and to run these events for free. And, and these events are free and accessible for, for everybody um, and to have these conversations uh, more often. Um, so now, uh, well, thank you um, for the speakers, to the speakers. And now um, I'm, I need to announce, um, I need to announce an important an important um okay let me see an important um news important news which is the Shiro's price uh for this edition um so i'm gonna share my screen i'm gonna share my screen um just hold on because i don't want to um discover that um just give me one second please okay so you want to display the names um, before. So, okay, so now I'm gonna share. Good. Okay, um, present. So, the, um, so that was the picture for the arts institutions question, <laughs> which represents very well, where is the women, um, the women's place in the art world. So hopefully it will change. Um, so again, thank you very much to, to, to where the speakers um, tonight. Um, the diversity of your background um, um, was um, very important for us to, to, to see many perspectives um, around uh, violence um, in the arts and in the visual history. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna announce the, um, the winners uh, for this edition. And now the winners are, so the first winner will be um, uh, Divya Mittal uh, with I Won't Do It. When do it, um, Divya, is Divya around? Um, is Divya? If you're around, can you unmute yourself? Oh, Divya, here you are. Oh, thank you so much. I um, yet didn't expect it, but I'm so thrilled. Um, thank you for um, letting me be part of, um, of the exhibition um, and for the events. I'm absolutely thrilled. Well, thank you, Divya. Well, congratulations uh, for this um, for this prize. And the second, and the second is okay. So let me see, Farnoosh. Farnoosh, a minute um, for rebirth. Um, Farnoosh, are you around? No. I I've seen Farnoosh before, but I'm not sure that she is if she is around. Well, never mind. Um, in any case, we're running super late. I would like to thank the attendants and, and speakers and artists uh, for joining us uh, tonight in the last event of Chiros Revoluciones. Um, next, um, we are planning uh, more events, uh, more talks, uh, more exhibitions, and of course, um, more projects um, to talk about um, women's, um, about violence against women and, and girls. Um, so thank you, have a lovely night, and, and please, if you have the survey, um, we're gonna send the survey um, afterwards. And, and yeah, well, thank you very much, and have a lovely night, all of you. Thank you.